Well, welcome to uh, Tech 5173 Global Technology Class, Master of Technology, Masters of Technology. And uh, we are delighted today to have a guest speaker. I wouldn't say guest speaker because he is, house, he is a household. <laughs> we are his guests. And uh, when you tell uh, or your grandchildren will ask you and say, Baharlu, Alan Baharlu, and read it in textbooks and books of history, and, and you tell them, I was in his class one time. I saw this man. I shook hands with him. I asked him. My dear friend, uh, Alan Baharlu, will talk with us and will take us in a trip that will take us maybe 5,000 years ago or maybe 2 billion years ago or whatever. One and a half. Defense, uh, just <laughs> and, and something in between. But let me tell you a couple of things about my friend, Alan Barlow. A dear friend over the years, this is my 15th year here. When I came, uh, he was a real uh, support for me, even without me knowing him. He started the friendship and it continued and multiplied. And we fight a lot together as friends. We differ a lot. So being friends <laughs> doesn't mean that I say amen to everything he says or he says amen to everything. But we play together the uh, pulling the, you call it tug or whatever. And uh, that's what makes the game good. So when he speaks today, I will differ with him. I'll fight with him in a very respectful way. And I want you to do this. And I'll tell you about him what I told you about me the first day we met. Do you know what I told them? What? I told them, don't believe me. I told them, I'm your professor, yes. I'm your instructor, yes. But don't believe a word of what I say. Check on me. Verify what I say. Don't stand in front of the judge and say, Sir, Professor Wabi said so. He will say, what say you? So please don't believe him. Don't believe me. Don't believe anybody. Just think and think right and verify things. Move on. And without much ado, uh, I will ask you to give a hand for Pete Grant and Wes for uh, taping us today. Here is uh, Katz. Please give them a hand. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Pete has been over the years with Wes, wonderful in uh, documenting our uh, uh, treasures that we have discussed in this class. Without much ado, here is my friend, Alan Barlow. Thanks. I look forward every semester to this occasion. Yes, he's my colleague and my friend. And as he said, everything you hear Evaluate it critically. That's one of the four goals of higher education. Critical thinking, reflective thinking, speaking, and ability to write. But critical thinking, look at the words event. People who just follow, they just have faith instead of thinking. So that's what Bafik want to tell you, to think anything you hear, evaluate it, and then make a judgment. But you are in a good position to do that. You are in higher education. So in the most advanced civilization in the world. So take advantage of that. Today I want to take you to a journey through time who has brought you to this level and all the facilities that you have, all technologies that you have. A spaceship Earth. Okay, so this presentation is science and technology, a stair step for the continuous ascent of Homo sapiens. Homo means sapiens means reasoning, reasoning, Homo sapiens. So we have come a long way. How did we get here? What was brought us to this level we are? Yeah, so that is the history that we will discuss. And if you have any question, anytime, please ask. OK, I need to bring that to a large case. Have I done it? OK. So it's a historical perspective, that means 
How did we start it? Where are we now? And what is our future? If assuming the Earth is 4.5 billion years, it's history. Take it to a 12 hours clock. At 2.52, say AM, we saw the first evidence of life in the sedimentary rocks in the Earth. 4.58, the first oxygen generating photosynthesis plants. At 6.32 AM, single-celled animals appeared. I'm, I'll show you to the place where we see all these. 8.52 AM, multicellular plants. And 10.35, diversification of animals, different species. And 10.42, land plants. And in 11.59, 13 seconds, is the early humans appeared. In other words, we have been a short time here. This is a George, one of the early species that we have the fossils. The first thing he was playing with the stone. This is a hard rock made of quartz, just and sparks the raw piece of rocks and with some dry grass around and start the fire. And he was able to shape the wood with his stone. Long, short, and different shapes. So he discovered the fire and beneath it to just a broken stone. This is called chert. It's a quartz, about seven hardness, if assuming diamond is ten. So we're able to use those rocks and got warm and was able to do things a little bit, changing things, making cook. So it started the journey. Well, this just all through time, philosophers, scholars developed and spoke and gave ideas step by step for us to look for ahead. And we took those ideas and evaluate it critically and try to apply it. That's when we come, you have come this far. So I'm going to share with you. History of science and technology. The history of technology is the history of invention of tools and techniques. And it's similar in many ways to the history of humanity. That's the substance. That's the tool. That's the invention that has brought us to where we are. Uh, every part of history. Background knowledge has enabled people to create new things. And conversely, many scientists' in endeavors have become possible through technologies, which assist humans to travel places we could not otherwise go, and probe the nature, dig holes, climb up of the universe, in more detail than our natural sciences allow us. These are the early people. Impressive. Find the rock, shape it, put it together. Remember, then have crane and all this thing. In the, such an angle to end up with a beautiful pyramid which still is there. Or shape these rocks. Careful man. These are the evidence of our ancestors. Impressive, majestic monument. We still puzzled about the, their imagination. The needles, saw Cleopatra needles, with history life on it. In Egypt, Acropolis, in Greek, 3,000 years. Persopolis, in Persia, in Iran. Shape the rocks, move the rocks, melt the. When you go to Persopolis and you see a huge auditorium with rocks, how did they put these rocks in angle together and kept it to stand on the, all those weight? It still is impressive when we go to these monuments in Egypt. Going a bit further, 
In 1961, U.S. President John F. Kennedy called on Congress to fund a space program to send man to the moon before 1970. Addressing our environmental problems, because you knew doing that, we'd invent a lot of new technologies. And shifting our political, economic, and social institution to a paradigm of sustainable development will require still more vision, resolve, and commitment. He knew that by that technology, we could go so far when we have that accomplished. And now you see with how it happened. The fact that astronauts reached the moon just eight years after Kennedy's speech demonstrates the power of human ingenuity in meeting a challenge and provides hope that we will be able to meet the larger challenge of living sustainable in Earth. 250,000 miles away, we go there and come back. How with machine takes us there? What kind of a fuel we use? But just let's decide to go. And we did that. Apollo 11 moon landing in July 28, 1969. Uh, we were going to go to heaven, above the earth, outside the earth. How dare we were? Yes. By the way, when Apollo 11, the lunar lander, approached the Sea of Tranquility, since Galileo thought these were ocean because they are named the ocean, astronaut, as you know, Armstrong and Lua, a system tells me do not land, I cannot land. We had 40 seconds to replicate the situation to see what was wrong, and we called back. I was in front of TV. Listen to Walter Cronkite broadcasting this. NASA told them, go and land. Take the stream wheel manually. You had too much data on your system. It's confused. And it sure did and took that and land. On July 20, 1969, the human race accomplished its single greatest technological achievement of all time when a human first stepped foot on another celestial body. Six hours after landing at 4.17 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time, with the whole world was risening, with less than 30 seconds of fuel remaining, Neil Armstrong, which was born August 55, 1930, and just died August 25, 2012, took the smallest step into our greater future when he stepped off the lunar module, named Eagle, onto the surface of the moon, from which he could look up and see Earth in the heavens as no one had. And you see some picture done before him. He was shortly joined by Buzz Aldrin, and the two astronauts spent 21 hours on the lunar surface and returned 46 pounds of lunar rocks. After the historic walks on the moon, they successfully docked with the command module, which is orbiting above Columbia, in which Michael Collins was patiently orbiting the cold but no longer lifeless moon. So they saw really from outside on the moon that the Earth was a spaceship. Spaceship Earth, a little space. When we say spaceship Earth, that means the system, a machine. That means all the principles, physics, chemistry, biology, all exactly, precisely, without exception, applies. That was spaceship Earth. So that's where we are in right now. Earth is only 12 uh, or 1,000 miles in diameter. which is almost a negligible dimension in the greater vastness of a space, our nearest star, our energy supplying mothership, the sun, is 92 million miles away. I have a question. At this moment, are you moving or you're stationary? Moving? Uh, 
You? How fast are you moving, by the way? Just guess. Just guess. How many miles per hour? Thousand. Thousand miles per hour. Is she right? She is moving. Yes. And you're moving too. Mm -hmm. Is she right? Thousand miles an hour? Um, not sure about that. More or less? Guess. Uh, more. Boy, you all are very optimistic. A little spaceship Earth is right now traveling at sixty thousand miles an hour around the sun because it has to complete a circle in 365 days. And it's also spinning, actually, which around itself. That's what you get day and night. Which at the altitude of Washington is about 1,000 miles an hour. So right now, we're going that fast. I don't feel it. Why? So we deserve the question we ask after they said that. What forces keeping us so that we don't feel it? So it's enormous speed going the same time around, moving and zipping around. 60,000 miles an hour around the sun and around itself. 1,000 miles an hour. Spaceship Earth was so extraordinarily well invented and designed that to our knowledge, humans have been on, that means you will see, designed precisely, concisely following physical, chemical principle, science, laws of science. No exception, no magic, no surprises. Extraordinary well invented and designed that to our knowledge, humans have been on board for two million years, not even knowing that they were on board of a ship, like some of you don't feel like you're moving. So part of the invention of the spaceship Earth and its biological life sustaining is that the vegetation on the land and the algae in the sea using photosynthesis are designed to make the life generating energy for us to an adequate amount. But we cannot eat all the vegetation. As a matter of fact, we cannot eat very little of it. We cannot eat the bark or wood of the trees, nor the grasses. But insects can eat these, and there are many other animals and creatures that can. We get the energy related to us by taking the milk and the meat from the animals. Again, all this process. In the imagination of those who are sensitive to the realities of our era, the Earth has become a spaceship. And this, perhaps, is the most important single fact of our time. The gases on technology has become so critical, so vital, and so important. It's a spaceship. You're the passenger, moving very fast, with limited space. For millennia, the Earth in humans' minds was flat and limitless. Today, as a result of exploration, speed, and the exploration of scientific and technological knowledge, Earth has become teeny sphere, closed, limited, crowded system, and hurtling through the space. Limited, closed system, this change in humans' image of their home affects their behavior in many ways and is likely to affect it much more in the future, your future, you that will guide the spaceship from now on. It is not only that human's image of the earth has changed, the reality of the world's social system has changed as well. 
as long as human was small in number and limited in technology, they could realistically regard the earth as an infinite reservoir, an infinite source of inputs, and an infinite cesspool of, for outputs. Today, we can no longer make this assumption. Earth has become a spaceship, not only in our imagination, but also in the whole realities of the social, biological, and physical system in which human is meshed. In what we might call the old days, when humans were small in numbers and Earth was large, they could pollute Earth with impunity. Though even then, then they frequently destroyed this immediate environment and had to move to a newer spot, which then proceed to destroy. Now humans can no longer do this. They must live in the whole system. I mean, we cannot put the sign at Mexican border, say no pollution allowed in the United States. Oh. Oh, cannot do that? We cannot put the sign and say no pollution from Minnesota could come down to the southern Mississippi River. Then we have this, this weird interconnected system. Do you mean whatever California decides about carbon monoxide emission affects us too in Illinois? So they cannot, as a state, say, I have the right to state to decide. These are all political, social factors coming. Had to move on to a new spot. They must live in a whole system. It's all related. It's one system with no borders, no boundaries. Like you in an airplane, if somebody smokes in front seat, you're going to smell it and you're going to inhale it. begin to develop quite a little thermodynamic sense. You know that you are either going to have to keep the machine, that's when technology is critical, the machine which operates with precise physical, chemical, biological, and geological principles in good order, or it's going to be in trouble and fail to function. We have not been seen on a spaceship Earth as an integrally designed machine which to be pers persistently successful must be comprehended and serviced in total. Now there is one substantially important fact regarding the spaceship Earth, and that is no instruction book came with it. We had to learn all of it. We have to discover it. Lack of instruction has forced us to find that there are two kinds of berries. Red berries that kill us. Red berries that will kill us. And red berries that will nourish us. And we had to find out ways of telling which was which. Red berry before we hate it or otherwise we would die. We had to find it. We had to know. Could I was say, oh God, please help me. This is not red poison berry. I ask God. Or ask Allah or ask what? Devil, devil, please that have devil, I will, I'll be nice to you. No, we have to find it and find it ourselves for our knowledge. That's what it means. We had to do it. So we were forced, because of the lack of instruction book, to use our intellect, which is our supreme faculty, to devise scientific and technological experimental procedure and to interpret effectively the significance of the experimental findings. Thus. Because the instruction manual was missing, we are learning how we safely can anticipate the consequence of an increasing number of alternative ways to extending our satisfactory survival and growth, both physical and metaphysical. The design of mission 
of the instruction book on how to operate and maintain a spaceship Earth and its complex life supporting and regenerating system has forced us to discover retrospectively just what our most important forward capabilities are. We are finally going to have to face the fact that we are a biological system, we are a system ourselves too, living in an ecological system and another system, and that our survival power is going to depend on our developing symbiotic relationship of a closed cycle character with all the other animals and population of the elements and population of the world of ecological system. These are great discoveries. Once we begin to look at Earth as a spaceship, the appalling extent of our ignorance about it is almost frightening. Finally, the consequence of Earth becoming a spaceship for the social system are profound and little understood. It is clear that much human behavior and many human institutions in the past, which were appropriate to a finite Earth, are entirely inappropriate to a small, closed spaceship. We are interrelated with no borders, no boundaries, interconnected. We cannot afford an unrestricted conflict, and we almost certainly cannot afford ra national sovereignty in an unrestricted sense. It is in our hand, and especially your hand, because you have the knowledge, you have the vision, you think critically, you want to know why and how. You are reflective. Uh, if this is my son, how do I want him to treat it? Oh, uh, making sarcastic remark, you just reflect it. You may apply to yourself. We cannot afford unrestricted conflict, and we certainly cannot afford national sovereignty in an unrestricted sense. Literally, it is in your hand. And the only knowledge, critical thinking. Can I just pray? Let me hang you from this wall and you play, not fall. No, you have to use your thinking. And that's what this class of Dr. Wafi teaches, technology, to train you to do that. Now the whole earth is in our hand. Collectively, disregard of our race and nationality, we must maintain it for now and the future generation. That, that's a moral obligation for our children. If this earth, just past this state, if this earth were only a few feet in diameter, floating a few feet above the field somewhere, people would come from everywhere to marvel at it. People would work, walk around it, marveling at this big pool of water, the little pool of water flowing between the pools. People would marvel at the bumps on it and the holes in it. And they would marvel at this very thin layer of gas surrounding it and the water suspended in the gas. The people would marvel at all the creatures in the water. The people would declare it precious because it was the only one. And they would protect it so that it would not be hurt, the ball would be the greatest wonder known, and people would come to behold it, to be healed, to gain knowledge, to know beauty, and to wonder how it could be. People would love it and def defend it with their lives, and the roundness could be nothing without it if the earth were only a few feet and in diameter. Seen from the moon, we first saw the beauty of the spaceship Earth, 
and the diverse characteristic for other solars. No water is here. There is no water here. There is no air here. There is no grass here. There is no cow here. There is no egg here. We saw a start comparing the character of a spaceship, but one of the acts in this, is, this case, the moon. Well, that historic moment, we left the Earth, we went to another celestial body. And when the lunar eagle landed and the ladder unfolded, and the Neil Armstrong stepped out. The whole world was watching that moment. And it stepped on the surface of the moon. By the way, this footprint would be there forever. Because there's no air, there's no water on the moon. Stay there. And he raised the American flag. There's no air, so it was made of aluminum. And at 4.17 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time, on July 20, 1962, the eagle has landed. A small step for human, a giant leap for humankind, as Neil Armstrong said. This is what technology, you mean technology could take us to the heaven and hell and all back and forth? Of course, if the above was heaven and hell was below. It was a famous picture, the moon in the background, American flag, Neil Armstrong, Collins, the colleagues that take the picture, reflection of the sun, all on the surface of the moon in one picture. We decided to go other part of solar system. And yes, a planet next to us. We always was fascinated. We had many movies, Martian coming and so on. So we decided to go look at the Mars because it's red color. We named it after God of War. And Mars Pathfinder was an American spacecraft that landed on the base station with a rowing rover on Mars in 1997, considered a lander named, which they renamed after Carl Sandberg, astronomer, and a lightweight 10.6 kilogram wheeled robot Mars, we called it Sojourners. We told Sojourner to go around, sample the Mars, sample the soil, sample the rocks, measure the air, and collect it back. You mean we were on Mars? That's right. And named this rock, but this, they call this couch because from distance, like a couch. And we look at the whole galaxy. We want to go there, every part of it. We are human. We have the power and the decision and the technology. We want to explore the entire solar system. And now we have later on Turkey, a spacecraft just about living our solar system, going to other galaxies. From Mercury to Venus to the Earth to the Mars to Jupiter, all these planets. By the way, this is a great picture of Venus. This is Venus. Ha, huh, I always see Venus white. Yes, because it's covered with thick cloud of CO2. Reflect the sunlight. So we always see, when we drop a spacecraft, a robot under it, this is the way it is. It's very hot, it's boiling. As a good example of global warming, perfect next door to us. Because of thick, that's on his white, that's on the god of, after god of beauty. 
when we go there, this, the volcanic eruption create a lot of CO2, which reflect the sunlight coming, and all this planet. We are going to go out of this system. This is Milky Way galaxy. It's Milky Way because of whitish color. Each of these is a sun like ours. There is a shooting star here, moving that light there. Yes, we're going to explore this. You just some of our impressive accomplishment, not just a few, as I said, I'm teaching the course Science and Technology. I developed it in 1982. Promise or a promise or a threat. Just want to see this consequence. One example. It's a hijacked plane heads straight for the second tower of 9-11. There was a man convinced the people, his followers, that his Americans have committed sin. And they are not Muslim. Remember, Muhammad said only Muslims go to heaven, all others go to hell. So if God sent these people to hell, why don't we help the God earlier? Those of you see Osama bin Laden talks. Go, go, God takes them to hell too. You, you, you only Muslims are saved. And convince these people to burn, destroy man and woman and children. When you don't think critically, you are vulnerable. That's what it happened. And of course, it was remember, man, human made this plane to go there. And those who just follow. That's technology. If hand happened to the hand of those people, And we have seen many examples of it. All the bombs in all the sites of war, Pakistan, Afghanistan. These are, there are many people who just follow. They don't have critical reflective thinking. Fortunately, you do. So, and one more example. This is Enola Gay, the pilot named after his mother. This Enola Gay is going to have a mission. And the mission is to take the first atomic bomb. Call it Fat Boy. And that's the plane who took off August 6, 1945 with this atomic bomb under his wing and dropped it at 8.15 a.m. on August 6, 1945. In Olegay plane dropped a 20 kiloton atomic bomb over Hiroshima, Japan. Moments after a mushroom cloud raises 20,000 feet over Hiroshima, Within 11 seconds, 200,000 people died. Still is taking life. Man, woman, children, old, young, vaporized, vaporized. Some distance from there, their eyes and every meat melted, so their skeleton just fell. And those of you familiar, Radioactivity have a half-life. Uranium is 4.5 billion years. So still there's radioactive substances there. It was buried. That's when said it's still taking life. Yes. Somebody decided to take that bomb and drop it. Well, some of you say Japan made a mistake, attack us in Pearl Harbor. Yes. But this is... But technology, if the hand and the power 
just want to tell you that it is. And three days later, another nuclear bomb dropped Hiroshima, September 8, 1945. Nagos 6, 1940, an atomic bomb Stanley destroyed almost all of the houses and buildings in Hiroshima. This is the reporter standing there taking those pictures to show you what the glances are. And three days later, these are all, these are the few people who survived. They burned. None of them survived after a while. The torture, the agony, the life. The problem, the photo from U.S. Signal Corps showed the devastation left after an atomic bomb exploded over Nakazaki three days later in August 9, 1945. Now we have several hundreds of much more powerful bombs in silos, ready to go, already targeted. I'll have some a president or prime minister say go. So I just want to show you the technology, that power, must be handled by people who are moral, ethical, think critically, reflectively, and see the end of using these systems. Again, as I hope that's you. So Science and technology. This gives you a glimpse of the introduction to it up to this point. A historical perspective. How various civilizations, cultures, and great thinkers have related to this and discovered the nature of science and technology. Your predecessor, those who were here before you. You all heard about Mary Leakey, a great anthropologist. Let me just view exam to see what it. For all the ancient skulls and prehistoric stone tools that Mary Leakey chiseled out of the rocks of East Africa here in Tanzania, what is accidental anthropologists will be best remembered for our feet feet prints. Actually, one day in 1978, on the arid Lanatoli plain of Tanzania, Leakey bent over an impression that looked as if had been made by human. With a dental pick and a brush, she painstakingly cleaned away the 3.5 million year old hardened volcanic ash that encased the print. Three hours later, convinced that the print had indeed been left by human ancestors, she stood up and announced, now this is really, this is really is something to put on mantelpiece or in a museum. The 75 foot long trail of crisp footprint had been made by three little humanoids, members of the human family, who ambled across the volcanic plain at the dawn of humankind. One of the, them seemed to pause and turn left briefly before continuing to the north, in this or in the ash. This relic of a behavior from eons back brought the find to life in a way that no other bones could not. As Leakey wrote, this motion, so intensely human, translate time. A remote ancestor experienced a moment of thought. The find helped overturn the prevailing wisdom that the seminal event in human evolution was the development of a big brain. Instead, it was standing up. We were only four foot. Now we stood up. Our hands were free. Our eyes become exercised front. And that brought, which freed the hands to make tools. Tool making simulated growth in the size and complexity of the brain. 
This new freedom of four limb posed the challenge Nicky wrote soon after discovery. The brain expanded to meet it, and humankind was born. These are the footprint, footprints made by Australopithecus uh, africanus as they walk across the ash scattered by a volcanic eruption over 3.5 million years ago. The footprints confirm skeletal evidence that the species and fully erect stances. This is, of course, we have it. Also, it's footprint of some animals going there. And the woman had a smaller footprint, man had larger footprint. It's part of it, pictures of it in the Smithsonian. They are precious clues to the past, rare fossil tracks left millions of years ago by humanity's ancestors. I feel so proud that I stand here and feel how long I have come. I owe all of it to my ancestors, to those who discover. I live twice as much as six years before. I don't know anybody, my scientists, my ancestors. That means your ancestors. I give credit. This is who we are. So, years ago, this was the, we have come a long way. This is the panorama that is in the Smithsonian Museum. Shows the volcanic ash, they walk in there and the picture. Life like dioramas of laboratory humanities with the stark landscape background in the Smithsonian Museum. An early step in human evolution. Just imagine, years from now, when we look at a step on the moon, wow, that was a historic moment going to the moon when we live solar system, when we are in other galaxies, and look back for that moment. Like exactly. And you all heard about Lucy, Australopithecus. It's also we find near Tanzania. This is the bones that we discovered and reconstructed. This is covered now to protect those footprints. Discovery of human footprints in East Africa reshaped the study of human origins. Now conservators have protected, protected fragile tracks from destruction. Okay, so I give you this, this introduction to this. Now let me bring you at that the moment all those who contributed to where we are now, to where we fly, we live longer, we look and we could look the picture from across the planet. Who were these people? So earliest technologies which fire and a stone, as I show you that. These are an old man. We're playing the chert, a, a, a spark, dry grass, start the fire, and then learn to shape the rocks, to make it arrows, other tools, to cut meat, smash things, you can beautifully shape them. As a be these are Im Im impressive technologies of our ancestors. A stone age, you all heard about it. So let's look at these ancient civilization. Fortunately, university is extremely fortunate. And all here, like Wafi, is having all this civilization introduced to the university. Egyptian was last year, and now this year's Greek civilizations. Their contribution, their culture, what they left for us, the messages, so long. Thanks, Rafi. It's really impressive. It's, we are unique as that. It's, OK, let me give you that. There was Greeks, which is this semester, Greek Symposium. Romans, Persians, Egyptians, and Mesopotamians. 
These are ancient civilizations. You all know they were here. Greeks, Rome, this is, as you well know, this is Iran, Persia, this is Egypt, this area of Baghdad, also is all Mesopotamia. They are the ones who put the foundation for all science and technology, who we are. Our views, our visions, our health, our facilities. So, but Persia changed name from Persia to Iran, Saudi, it's mean, yes, all Egypt, Greeks. So, the Earth's natural forces, this is where this ancient civilization faced. Natural forces. Volcanoes, earthquakes, tornadoes, hurricane, thunder, lightning, seasonal climates, forest and brush wildfires, diverse forms of life and their relationship and disease and death have been of intense interest to Homo sapiens since their earliest appearance on Earth. All this will happen. Suddenly, a big storm will come. A fire appears, big hails, earth would shake. Just remember, it's don't have all the scientific background. Not. Earth, what or who is responsible? They want to, who is responsible for these events? They couldn't, they couldn't predict, they didn't have weather stations, so on, like so on. Understanding the cause and effect of these natural forces are the stepping stones and the staircase of science and technology, and the ascent of Homo sapiens in a continuous journey of knowledge and excellence. So how did ancient civilization in the beginning explain this? Role of gods and goddesses in ancient civilization. They assigned gods and goddesses. They said were blessed with powers and cursed with human emotions like love and anger. They said, this is, this is, these gods and goddesses are doing. They're nice, but don't double cross them. They get, you know, it's called a reflection of their own attributes, powers, and curse with human emotion like love, because they didn't understand the cause of these. Their resistance, their residence, has been atop of Mount Olympus in, Iraq, in Greece, the highest mountain of Greece from which derives also their characteristic name, Olympian gods. The important characteristic of Olympian 12 gods was their immortality. Each one of them has the ability to appear in front of mortals and provide them with advice and help. Many examples of that can be found in the Iliad and Odyssey, works of poet Homer. In them, many times, god Athena appears in various forms to Odysseys, as has been in Proctor. It is not rare, of course, to see the opposite. Some of these ancient Greek gods to get angry with the mortals and try to harm or punish them. So fire, hurricane, tornado, volcanic, you made this, Vulcan, God of Vulcan, they got angry. All this ancient civilization these, their gods had all these characteristics. So they couldn't explain it. This is Pantheon, is the Greece where the gods used were there. This is Rome, where the gods and goddesses were. This is Mecca, where the Muslims. So, Egypt, for example. Ceres was one of the most important deities of ancient Egypt. Versus is one of the considered to be the first ancient Egyptian god to be officially recorded in written scripts of ancient Egypt, since Orsis is the god of afterlife. And as you see their pictures and they drawn. Interesting things that all of these have our shapes, our body shape. 
and all have our characteristic. All of these. Poseidon, for example, is the god of the ocean. When the sea came up and flooded and many areas were near the sea wiped out and people. God of the sea. Trident is a weapon that could shake the earth when he would shake it and destroy any object. And Zoroaster, which is Persian god, power. And Mitra, meteorology comes from here, it was goddess of Persian rain and so on. They all had its characteristic. All the earth's event associated with the gods and goddess. Many of them. Sistine Chapel, which is history of all the religion, really, but that this is the god of Muslim, Mesopotamians. And had power. Told Abraham to go get your only son, Isaac, and get it to that rock and cut his toes if you want to believe me. To tell him what to say. Go do that. All you heard about it. So they had both cat. Moses. And then came down from Mount Sinai. I have climbed Mount Sinai. Did like that. Saw this some people having drunk so on. Open chasm. And all fall in and drawn. So all these Muhammad, so all of them had this characteristic which developed with these ancient civilizations. And many of these pictures of activities, scientists in the wall, I go to this. So the scientific revolution. Who are these people who went before us and made it possible for us to be who we are, to have what we have, to live as long as we live, to have the life we have? Francis Bacon, René Descartes, I'm going to tell each of them, and Copernicus, Thomas Malthus, Galileo, Da Vinci, Isaac Newton, excuse me, I'm too fast. Immanuel Kant, Charles Darwin, or Einstein's. So, the scientific revolution, Renaissance, nature is subject to rational natural laws. The most fundamental, the most profound statement. And also, oh, I thought it was magic. I thought it was devil were doing it. I thought God the goddesses were doing it. No. Has precise cause. Scientific. Go find it. Nature is subject to rational natural laws. That's the most profound statement who has brought us to this level. Imagine if we didn't believe in that. And these laws apply to animals, to plants, to the smallest piece of solid atom, to the smallest part of living DNA, to liquid, to solid, to small and peace, all and everything. This is what has brought us this far. We believe there was a cause, rational, natural cause. Imagine if we believe it's work of gods and goddesses. We can't do anything. We, do anything. we cannot stop it. We're saying, no way. Just don't waste your time. If they want a tornado comes, tornado comes. But we, this was the most fundamental step we took to brought us where we are. There were natural magic those days, witchcraft, alchemy, these all sorts of things. There were people who had magic power, could make things. Things disappear and things come in. You get sick, you die. In the beginning, many of these people also came to explain 
the causes of events. And which, remember, which sign of contact with the devil. They were devil followers. So they hanged them. The history shows how dangerous our conjectures about the world can become. Those who were ignorant, who thought, this is, she did it. Do you remember that light in industry? She did it. That witch did it. Oh, find him. Find her. There were people who believed on those, that's what it means. The world can become, once they lose touch with reality, we have it now. The victims of a witch hunt in the 17th century, they were hanging in the public. And everyone was joyful, coming, having picnic when these witches were, like exactly like Hitler, to the Jews in the streets. They did that. OK, now, let me briefly give you the, some of the contribution of these great ancestors out, who brought us hope, dignity, life, happiness. Francis Bacon, what did he say? Mechanic, this philosophy, everything can be explained by physical, chemical, biological laws. It can be explained, it must be explained. If it doesn't be explained, it's, this is the reason for it. It's clear, concise, that called mechanics, this philosophy, applies precise scientific technological laws. Nature obeys the laws of science, without exception. They said. Rene Descartes, what was his contribution? He said a profound statement I think, therefore I am. That means you exist if you can think critically. Otherwise, you guide it, pull here and there, every direction. Somebody else have your destiny. That famous Auguste Rodin, the thinker in Paris Museum, a majestic, impressive statue. The nakedness of Rodin, famous statue of solitary thinker, deeply wrapped in thought, suggests that human is uniquely reflective, reflective and self-ever living, and that this is something fundamental to the human condition. I was just hearing on TV, just before I came here, preachers said, but that's God's word that homosexuals are sinners. And imagine some people believe in that. And go hurt them, insult them. Imagine if that person was reflected. Wait a minute, if my son is homosexual, how do I want him to be too treated? That calls reflective, which is a the most powerful of scientific. Self-aware living, and that this is something fundamental to the human. When we are human, we have those senses. That's what it exactly says. We are reflective and think critically. One of the concepts, geocentering concept. We in the beginning said Earth is where we are on it, created God. Earth is in the center of universe, called geocentric concept. It was believed for a long time. And even the pictures drawn, this is the Earth, and all other things goes around it. And the hell, by the way, is below the Earth. This is Earth. Earth and all other planets around it. That was the image of the Earth. Then the science and technologies. Believed by ancient civilization, Jews, Christians, and Muslims. 
because earth where we are on it and we created in God's image so it's a special place then Nicholas Copernicus who said the tales of Helios century he said he divides, he looked at the motion of stars and planets and days and night and season and now he's strictly think he thinks critically he wants reason and he looks for evidence he said heliocentric concept sun is in the center of universe oh you kicked out our earth out of center of universe oh you were in a lot of trouble and you will see and even the pictures sun and the other planet going around it. This is where the Earth is. And same as pictures, which is by the way in the Sistine Chapel again. That was big event. He displaced the Earth from the center of the universe. And a lot of people were angry. And you know, when people are angry, what they do? You saw an example of it a few weeks ago. Somebody had a video insulting Muhammad, and people went and killed four innocent. Four innocent had nothing to do with it. When you don't think reflectively and critically. Some people always take advantage of those. And that was, some people got upset with that. So, Galileo, you all heard about it, who fixed a telescope with several different size, thickness of glass, and look up and saw the motion of the stars. And now he had evidence supporting that concept. Oh. Explain and spread the heliocentric concept. And they wrote a book. And you see here it is, it shows you the pictures. The love, Ptolemy, Bernskus, and yeah, they wrote a book. These three, the famous front pieces of a book that they wrote uh, concerning the two system of the world. 1960, from left to right are Aristotle, Ptolemy, and Copernicus. Explained their evidences. It's difficult and published it. Oh, that so, they angered the Pope. And you all know, have a trial. And Galileo brought his telescope, put it up, and he said, holy, and come look at it. The truth shall set you free. That was that was the straw that broke camel's back. Embarrassed, as you know, was under horse arrest, Galileo. And Da Vinci, Leonardo Da Vinci, all heard about him, great painter also. He discussed the first good definition of science and technology. I said, physician versus surgeon. Physician are scientists. Surgeons are technologists. They use a concept to heal, to fix, to repair, maintain. Isaac Newton. You have a famous story. He was sleeping in the area. An apple fell out of the tree on his head. Shows here, and he saw 
just observing it, he saw the apples which were higher, when falling, they create more pressure on his head. And the bigger, wait a minute, why the bigger apple hurt harder? And throw some rocks. You want me to finish? Uh, stop. Just a second. Uh, just a break. It's here. And when you read his literature that he wrote some of them, if you ever go to Italy or Paris, you will see some of it written by all his hand. I've taken a group to Europe. Take it there. Isaac Newton, he just observed the bigger apple, heard more, they came faster. And he came to our from science and experimental philosophy. He brought the Newton law of gravity. Gravity depends on the speed and mass of the subjects. Still we use it. We use that to take our spacecraft all the way to the moon, to the Mars, and bringing things down, airplane, everything. No magic is a law. Word, again, once more, is a great machine, mechanistic philosophy. Do you want me to stop here? Or? Is this a good stopping point? That's good. You could stop here. Okay, we'll turn you the are the boss. No, you are. We will turn the lights up like this. And uh, uh, would you give him a round of applause, please? Thank you very much. If you want to stay, ask me any question, please do so. Some of this concept, your higher education, it could bother some of you. I used to be like you, if you are any one of you were here. I was born in Iran, in Persia, dominated by Islam. I saw what would happen if somebody disagreed with you, with your concept of the world, with concept of humanity. I was angry because when we go to mosque, my mother has to go the other side of the curtain, cover herself. Couldn't see it, man. Cover completely. Why? Because women are the seduced man. You see if they have any part shows up. I saw those. So I live in the place that you couldn't ask questions. Fortunately, live in a country that we have the freedom to express ourselves in a collegial manner. So. If you please, with all emotion you have. When did you leave? I live in November 10, 1961, landed in New York City. My, I still remember that moment. My eyes were full of tears. I couldn't believe I was there. You left before the uh, uh, revolution? The Shah was there, the dictator. I live under a dictator, Shah of Iran, King of Iran. But was he open-minded? No, no dictators open-minded. If you follow them, I was sitting in a movie theater, I never forget. And always movie theater in Persia and Iran, in the beginning showed the national anthem, which is praise of the Shah. I wasn't feeling good. And everybody has to stand up. I couldn't stand up, really had a great fever. Police came, dragged me, like this, all the way taking me out of the movie theater and kicked me in my butt twice and said, I don't want you here anymore. I said, I'm sick. I couldn't stand up. I'm sorry. I apologize. This is where I live. This is what I saw. More law was go on top of a called step case and praise. I didn't see a single woman being a mullah. What mullah means? Being a religious leader. Have you, how many priests, how many women are priests, by the way? How many? In the uh, church? How many women have been ordained as a priest? In the Catholic Church. Catholic Church? Have there, have None. You see, you see it every place. What is wrong with the woman that cannot be a priest? God said, 
you gave the apple to Adam, and he ate, and his eyes got open, and caused us to kick him from Garden of Eden, you committed original sin. Otherwise, you'll be in Garden of Eden. And our eyes were closed. We didn't have to. So I lived in that other system. I seen it, and I see it here. How many women have been president in the United States? How many have been vice president in the United States? None. So, so it is not all places. There's prejudice for people who don't think critically, who cannot respect their mother, their sister, their daughter. Their mind is so covered and grabbed that they don't see. How can I do anything? I want to have two daughters. My wife is a woman. My mother is a woman. My grandmother is a woman. See, that's what Dr. Bob, this is the class side. And I can't talk like that here. Oh, if it was a Catholic university, I would be kicked out, by the way, 30 minutes from now. Say that. What is wrong with a woman that cannot be a priest? So you were kicked from Iran because of that? You are... No, I became valedictorian. I studied hard, became valedictorian, the entire university would have given me the permission, tuition, a scholarship to go outside the country to study and come back. To come back? To come back. I left and went to University of Michigan, language university. And in 1963, I married my wife, Colleen Bahalu, Rafik knows, is a woman. I'm American. A week later, I got a letter in my post office box. She is American? She's American, Colleen, my wife. I'm a, a letter said, you have married a foreigner. All a scholarship, all everything has been discontinued. The next day, this exactly happened. I'm telling this story in October 12 that I get an award in the I Foundation. Took that to my department chair, Dr. Charles Mankin, University of Oklahoma. I was in geophysics field master and told Dr. Mankin said, Alan, don't be worried about it. I reestablish your scholarship. I give you a job for your expenses. He did that. He did it for me, an American. And I stayed. Owe it to this country. I got my PhD. I have been dean and department chair. I have accent. They know that I was an American. I was born like that. I've never, nobody ever treated me differently. I've got most of the award possible. This is means when people most at least think critically and reflectively. Well, uh, he has been for an hour now almost throwing pebbles, sometimes rocks, in the pool of my mind. I'm not sure about you, but I have five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen questions for him. Back, because I didn't agree with some things that he said, and I'm not sure about you. I'm not going to start asking him back uh, about things that... I didn't accept in his speech, and I'm not sure about you. But let's take five minutes, make it 10 minutes, and then come back promptly in 10 minutes. Yeah, have a nice break. But I, nice. If you, I'm, I'd be happy to answer a question if you take a shorter break. one-on-one -on -one thing, oh. so come and do that. But we love to have it. I hope you have questions. Okay. Have a 10 minutes and come back, please. <laughs> 